Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. Welcome to this month's NeuroSim webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Xinyun Chen, um, who's a PhD candidate at Berkeley working with Don Song uh, on problems at the intersection of deep learning, programming languages, and security. And um, I think recently she's been doing especially a lot of work on program synthesis, including some work, I believe, that on Google Sheets. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so she'll, today she's going to be telling us about uh, some of that work. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, whenever you're ready, please. Yeah, I can get started now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Oswald, for the introduction. And uh, thanks again for inviting me here. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Xin Chen. So I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. In this talk, I will discuss my research on uh, neural program synthesis. And I will motivate my research from the perspective of understanding languages and interacting with a variety of data through programming. And I would like to uh, investigate what symbolic representations can add upon existing neural models. Nowadays, we have seen that standard deep neural networks can achieve a very good performance on like, many application domains. For example, on uh, uh, classic uh, selection or classification problems, we can see that in many cases, deep neural networks can even surpass human performance, such as on some image recognition and text extraction problems. In general, deep learning based approaches could be pretty powerful when training and test samples are drawn from similar distributions. Also, the performance could be pretty good if solving the task does not rely on very in depth reasoning. However, so far, deep neural networks still have some limitations. For example, they are not very capable of performing some logical and numerical reasoning tasks. For example, if we uh, simply rely on deep neural networks to perform some mathematical calculation, then uh, such uh, models will not perform this uh, computation in a very robust way, especially when the model is required to generalize to some new numbers during the test time. Meanwhile, those problems that require multi-step computation or derivation will also be pretty challenging for models. Such problems include some theorem proving and program synthesis problems. Usually we can see that uh, the models will uh, have like a worse performance when the solutions becomes more complicated. Furthermore, compared to human intelligence, a key drawback of deep neural networks is that they are not very capable of compositional reasoning. Here on the slides, I'm introducing an experiment designed by Brendan Leck et al, uh, which was uh, designed to evaluate humans or neural models ability to perform compositional reasoning. Basically, in the study instructions, we can see some pseudo words paired with uh, sequences of circles with different colors. Learn during the test time, all the participants are required to generalize this knowledge to annotate the corresponding circle sequences for some new combinations of pseudo words. Then uh, also we can see that uh, some uh, test instructions can be longer than the study instructions. From the percentage numbers shown on the slides, you can see that from only slightly more than 10 study instructions, most of the humans are already able to like, uh, learn the mapping between the pseudo words and the circles uh, sequences. So they can annotate the corresponding uh, circles of different colors to these new test instructions with a very high accuracy. However, standard sequence to sequence models or language models in general could have a hard time achieving this level of generalization, especially with a very small training set. Such limitations of standard deep neural networks have achieved uh, more and more attention in recent years. And people have been designing different approaches towards addressing these challenges, including new architectural design and new training schemes. Personally, I'm very excited about uh, integrating some uh, symbolic techniques into neural network design. And I believe uh, many people in this seminar are also very interested in this direction. So in particular, I've been focusing on including some explicit symbolic modules into the neural networks to really empower the neural model with the capacity of executing primitive functions and uh, composing them 
to form expressive and complex programs. So uh, with, with this like uh, central central design, uh, I will like uh, discuss uh, two uh, two folds of my research goals in program synthesis. First, I consider program synthesis as a means for compositional reasoning, and I have been working on bridging neural and symbolic techniques for generalization and data efficiency. The central research question I would like to investigate here is how far could learning models go beyond superficial pattern matching? And what is the role of symbolic reasoning here? On the other hand, program synthesis has been a long-standing challenge and also has a, a lot of applications. So I also think about program synthesis problems as great playgrounds for measuring the complexity of tasks that can be achieved by learning models. So in terms of the applications, I've also been developing neural program synthesis approaches that synthesize complex programs from diverse applications. And the question I would like to explore here is how well can program synthesizers infer and understand the human intent, especially when the program specifications are not very explicit and detailed. Then uh, with these like, two aspects of like, program synthesis problems, in this talk, I will discuss like uh, three concrete topics. The first topic is about uh, program synthesis applications to synthesize uh, programs from different specification formats, like uh, the programming by example problems. And also we can synthesize programs uh, with text. And we can also develop program synthesis techniques for some uh, software development. The second topic is about a uh, neural symbolic language understanding to like uh, incorporate some symbolic knowledge to understand complicated texts. The third topic is about compositional generalization to generalize the learned knowledge to some new combinations of the input words. Although uh, these three problems seem a bit different, actually all of them are highlighting uh, two central challenges in program synthesis from different perspectives. The first challenge is generalization. Specifically, for standard program synthesis applications, we usually assume that the training and test samples are kind of drawn from similar distributions. And this is also the case for some recently developed code generation tools that have neural language models as the backbone. On the other hand, for compositional generalization, we emphasize more on the change when training and test distributions differ. The second important challenge is the input complexity. To better disentangle the factors that cause the generalization gap in terms of like evaluating the compositional generalization, for such topics, uh, we have been mainly focusing on those like, uh, problem domains where we can control the data distributions. So in this case, the data could be synthetically generated and they might follow some well-defined rules. On the other hand, for program synthesis applications, I've been focusing more on real-world deployment. So in such cases, the program specification formats themselves could be pretty ambiguous, noisy, and uh, complicated. Then uh, in this talk, I will uh, like select some uh, of my recent works from each of these three topics. First, uh, for program synthesis applications, as uh, Osbert introduces, I will uh, talk about our work on spreadsheet coder, where we show how we can develop neural program synthesis models to work in production. Secondly, I will talk about my work on neural symbolic programmers for understanding complicated attacks. In the last part of my talk, I will discuss our work on neural symbolic machines for compositional generalization. So let's get started with the first part of my talk about spreadsheet coder. Our spreadsheet coder work started as a research project and we got a paper uh, accepted in ICML this year. But now we also integrate the spreadsheet coder model into Google Sheets product to support spreadsheet formula prediction. And as somewhat described in this related news title, our formula suggestion model acts like autofill for math. 
because in many cases, people write spreadsheet formulas to calculate some statistics based on their data. Here is a simple demo to illustrate how spreadsheet coder works. So as you can see, uh, every time when the user wants to write a spreadsheet formula, our spreadsheet coder model will be activated and uh, pr produce some uh, suggested formulas when applicable. And as you can kind of observe from this demo, in most cases, users do not really explicitly write down the descriptions of the formulas they want. But still, our spreadsheet coder model can uh, get some formulas that fit reasonably well into the spreadsheet uh, context. So in terms of the application, there is another related framework called FlashView, which was designed for string transformation on Excel spreadsheets. Basically, they formulate this formula prediction problem as a programming by example problem. And they consider each data row in a spreadsheet as an input-output pair. So they will uh, generate some programs in their domain-specific language to do some stream processing. In terms of the pro problem scope, in our project, we aim to really uh, like predict spreadsheet uh, formulas that cover a variety of functionalities. And we also want the model to work in real-world user-written uh, Google Sheets, which could uh, have like a very many uh, various uh, different table layouts and also uh, the data content itself could be pretty uh, noisy. So uh, with this like uh, different like, uh, goals of the project, we uh, also have want to highlight some uh, key observations that uh, drive us towards some uh, different design choices in our final model. First, in uh, spreadsheets, usually uh, they do not really have less, like some uh, data cells, but also we might have some uh, table headers which could provide high level descriptions of data. Therefore, although people usually do not really write a spreadsheet formulas to call such header cells as the arguments, still it could be helpful to utilize these table headers as auxiliary information for formula prediction and understand the data. Secondly, spreadsheet uh, formulas uh, do not only like uh, operate on a single row or a single column. Instead, the formulas can have rectangular ranges. And uh, in some cases, we can also like uh, call the cells from multiple rows and columns simultaneously as the arguments. Therefore, it could be beneficial to model the spreadsheet data as a unified table instead of some independent input-output pairs. If we look into this, a single spreadsheet table, we can see that uh, in some cases, even with, within uh, just a single table, we can still see that uh, different data elements are arranged in different ways. Some are arranged as uh, row-wise blocks, while others can be arranged as column-wise blocks. Then in terms of the spreadsheet uh, language, actually this language itself uh, is pretty rich. It does not only support some string transformation, but also supports some mathematical calculation. And uh, we can even write some simplified if statements using the spreadsheet language. So in total, uh, we can support around like a um, hundred like, uh, operators when we write the spreadsheet formulas. With these observations, our problem setup is that we want to predict the formula in a full spreadsheet language, given the headers and the surrounding cell values as the input. Now I will discuss uh, some uh, key uh, design choices in our spreadsheet coder architecture. In terms of the input encoding, we model the spreadsheet data as uh, semi-structured tables. And we design uh, both row-wise and column-wise table encoders to represent different kinds of tabular structures. Then uh, because uh, the, the spreadsheet tables can sometimes be very large, so we also need to model the long range dependency among uh, cells that are distant from each other in the original input table. So for the purposes of efficiency and simplicity, we uh, design the BERT encoders to, for local table block embedding, which will compute an embedding vector for each token in the input table. 
Then after the bird encoding, we also have a convolution component for learning global contextual representations of uh, each row and column. So in this way, if uh, two cells are in the same row or in the same column, even if they are very far away from each other and they are not uh, within the, a single like a uh, table block, still uh, they will have the same uh, shared tabular context for computing their contextual vectors. Then uh, for formula prediction, I designed a two-stage decoding process. Basically, our decoder will predict the formula sketch first, which includes both spreadsheet functions and literals. Then it will decode the concrete cell regions, which are the relative uh, cell uh, positions to the current target cell in the input table. Now I will discuss our evaluation. So basically we train and evaluate all models on a collection of the Google Sheets shared uh, within Google. Then uh, from this, like, uh, I will first share our results on the full formula accuracy measurement, which requires the predictive formula to be syntactically the same as the ground truth annotated formula. Then uh, from this uh, table, you can see that our full model can achieve uh, over 42% top one accuracy, which we find is uh, like high enough to be uh, practically useful. Then uh, from the comparisons to other baselines, we mainly want to uh, emphasize that modeling the, like the tabular structure of the input is very important for achieving a good performance. So uh, it is uh, uh, like more uh, helpful learn like modeling the inputs at some input output pairs due to like the same structure like the input uh, data. Here uh, we show some breakdown results on the form on formulas of uh, different numbers of operators. So we can see that uh, as the formulas uh, become like uh, longer and more complicated, the performance of all models will drop, but still our full model achieves the best performance in a uh, different like, uh, groups of formulas with different difficulty. Here I'm showing some um, like accuracy measurements to like uh, see whether at least a part of the predictions uh, are still like, accurate. So a uh, sketch accuracy means that uh, both the uh, special functions and literals are predicted correctly, but the cell references, uh, which are the arguments to the special functions might be wrongly predicted. Then uh, for the range accuracy, this is the reverse. So this requires the predicted uh, cell references to be accurate and also the order should match the ground truth. But the special functions can be predicted wrongly. So it means that the model may cause another function which, uh, which accidentally have the, uh, require the same number of uh, arguments. Then uh, from these results, we can see that uh, even if our model uh, does not predict the full formula 100% uh, accurate, in most cases, at least part of the predictions are helpful. So uh, still uh, our model is uh, like uh, providing some like, useful information for the users and it uh, has uh, learned some like, uh, good like, uh, like, in, like signals from the input data. Uh, finally, I will show our results uh, without headers. So uh, here we can see that if we exclude the headers from our model input, then performance becomes very bad. So from another perspective, it shows that headers play a critical role in, a, uh, like in, in achieving a good prediction performance. And our model in this makes good usage of the header information to make the predictions more accurate. So uh, this is the first part uh, of my talk about a uh, special coder. Any questions so far? Hi, Xin Yu. Um, I'm wondering, is there any way to like uh, elicit the user's intent I mean, based on how they react to the suggestions? Yeah, so basically this is uh, more about like the interaction. So in our like uh, current uh, like um, format, so basically uh, this this prediction the uh, uh, tool is like uh, like auto like some like auto suggestion. So basically, if you uh, like let's say type type in the type of uh, key, then it will uh, like uh, just just uh, use the the prediction. Or otherwise, you can like uh, just uh, do some do some fix by adding some other like, characters. 
then uh, with your suggestions, a uh, model will still like uh, kind of uh, treat it as the prefix to generate some like um, to kind of uh, complete the new formula. So if you are thinking about like uh, filling a single formula, then indeed users can make some edits and the system will react um, in the real in the real time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I don't know if you're going to talk about this at all and how much you can say about it, but I'm just wondering generally if you, like, since this was something that was deployed, like whether there were any interesting challenges that you faced in doing so or. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, there are definitely uh, still some uh, challenges. So uh, one thing we haven't really done is that uh, how much of the tablet structure we can use. So basically for, especially for those very large tables, all the different data blocks could be arranged in a hierarchical way. So probably there will be some like um, huge uh, headers then inside different like uh, small table of blocks, there could still be some headers. So basically right now for our uh, like um, table encoding, which only kind of uh, treat uh, this like input table as uh, like, um, as just a, just a single table block in some sense. So it didn't really like, model the hierarchical structure, but in some like, uh, more complicated uh, cases of prediction, we find that if a model can really understand the hierarchy, so that for example, it can, it can know uh, the total sum of an element could be the sum of several blocks instead of just uh, like kind of concatenating all the columns, then such kind of information could also be useful for prediction. And I believe for this, probably we also need some, let's say graph neural network style architecture for encoding it might like further improve the performance. But at the same time, we also need to think about the efficiency. So we want the model to like uh, run very quickly uh, with the TPU. So this is a trade-off. So right now the model architecture is uh, still like a simplified to just uh, treat the input as um, just, just a, a one, one level a table in some sense. Yeah, that's, an, so just kind of following up on the last part. So in terms of the inference time, so is it, so is it, do you actually run this in real time on the spreadsheet? So every time the user is typing something, you run the model? Yeah, uh, right now it can run in, in real time. So uh, there oh. has been a lot of like working engineering about like uh, speeding up the inference time on TPU. So right now yeah. it is very fast, yeah. Yeah, so that's it. It's, that's... It's, it's not run in the browser, it's uh, like remotely on the TPU. Yeah, because we have the BERT model, we need TPU for inference. <laughs> yeah, still, that, that must be a lot of executions of BERT that are happening all the time. But yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, any other questions before we move on? OK, uh, then I will uh, dis discuss the second part of my talk about like uh, neural symbolic programmers for uh, language understanding. So for this part, I will use uh, reading comprehension as a problem uh, where the passages could be like uh, pretty complicated. So uh, for standard reading comprehension problems, the problem setup is that given a passage and a question, we want to provide the answer to the question grounded on the passage. Then for most existing reading comprehension benchmarks, the answer to the question are kind of uh, coming from a single span in the passage. So this is why most of existing neural reading comprehension models kind of formulate the problem as a text extraction problems. So in this way, our encoder can be our like favorite language model architectures. We can use BERT T5 GBT style models, whatever you like. So with this encoder, we can compute an embedding vector for each a question and passage token. Then uh, we, on top of the encoder, we can have some fully connected layers to predict a probability for each passage token and see whether it could be the start or the end of the answer span. Then uh, during the training time, we can use the ground truth answer spans as our training supervision. Then we can do some supervised learning. Conceptually, this framework looks pretty simple, but uh, with recently proposed like, language models, which can produce very high quality contextual vectors, we can see that such models actually perform very well on standard reading comprehension benchmarks. For example, on the squad benchmark, these neural models have like surpassed human performance a while ago. Um, more recently, with the success of GPT-3, we can see that if we have a very a giant model and we pre-train it on like, a very massive like uh, text corpus from the web, then uh, without any fine tuning on a specific benchmark, 
such pre-trained models might even like achieve the same level of performance uh, to those models that are uh, fine-tuned on this specific benchmark. So this uh, happens on like this trivial career benchmark. So uh, this very impressive performance achieved by the pre-trained language models kind of drives people to rethink whether pre-training is already enough to enable these models with some capacity of future generalization and even reasoning. Then uh, to still uh, highlight some weaknesses of these very powerful models, there are some recent benchmark proposed to emphasize the necessity of performing some discrete reasoning. And one example is called job. Then uh, from some of these examples uh, shown on the slides, you will see that uh, some of these questions clearly cannot be answered by existing uh, language models, uh, especially those that focus on text extraction. For example, the arithmetic questions require the model to manipulate different numbers appeared in a passage. Counting questions require the model to identify uh, all mentions of related entities uh, that uh, correspond to the questions. And multi-span extraction questions require the model to include more than one spans as in its final answer. Compared to a uh, squad style reading comprehension benchmarks, job benchmark focuses more on numerical reasoning and its answer formats are also more diverse. Therefore, if we naively rely on pre-trained language models, then the F1 score is at most around 36, which is clearly below human performance. So the key message you want to convey here is that pre-trained language models are definitely important, but we need something more to really enable the model to better perform some reasoning tasks. Then uh, to achieve this goal, we propose the neural symbolic reader framework. The idea is that we can still build our model upon the existing success of a pre-training, which means that we still use some like a uh, similar like um, language models uh, as our like uh, encoder to compute the input embedding vectors. But uh, our main uh, like innovation comes from the decoder side. So instead of asking the model to directly generating like the answers to the questions, we design a programmer as our decoder which will generate a program that can be executed to produce the answers. Here on the slides, I'm showing an example of programs that can be generated by our model. So this program is to solve a counting question. And if you look into the like, passage span selected by the model for the counting operator, you will see that like, like, like a kind of uh, align very well with our input questions. And notice that such uh, programs are not available in the data set. So this could make our training pretty challenging. And I will discuss how to train our model uh, in this case later. By designing such a neural symbolic framework, our approach combines the distributed representations of the passage and question learned by the reader component and symbolic representations of the prediction rationale generated by the programmer component. Then there are two challenges emerge. The first challenge is to how to bypass the structured parsing process. So this is more about how we can like, design our like, program, program space so that we can really like taking this like, input passage and question tokens as our like um, model input because each of these type passage and questions are just uh, unstructured text. And the second challenge is how to train our model with weak supervision, where is there's a no annotated ground truth programs for training, and we only have the final answers as the supervision. So actually, uh, these challenges kind of are uh, shared about a, a variety of uh, neural symbolic tasks uh, when we do not have like the annotations of the intermediate steps towards our final answer. Then to tackle the first challenge of designing the program space, Here's where our domain-specific language comes in. The key design choice is that we introduce span selection operators not only for like span extraction questions, but they can also serve as the basic operators for other operators to call. So the other operators can use uh, these span extraction operators to select their arguments. 
Here I'm showing some examples of the counting and sorting uh, programs. Well, we can see that we can use the passage span uh, value operators to select some key value pairs as the arguments to these programs. Then the second challenge is to train our model with weak supervision, where well, there is no annotated ground truth programs for training. And there are two issues related to this challenge. The first issue is uh, sp called spurious programs. So uh, I will use an example to kind of uh, describe what we mean by spurious programs. So for example, when we are given a question, how many yards total were the training and last touchdowns of a game? And suppose uh, this uh, example is in the training set. So we have the annotated ground truth answer, which is eight. Then when this passage is pretty like long and includes many numbers, then there could be uh, many possible programs leading to the same answer. It could be the sum of three and five, can be the difference between 28 and 20. And it can even be a counting program calling eight passage spans as the arguments. For humans, uh, with, with some like manual investigation, we can know like which program is semantically coherent uh, to the question. But for models, it will be very hard to like distinguish among dif different programs because all of them are leading to the same answer. So uh, for, tra for the training purpose, these programs are not like ha having the same effect. So if we use the semantic correct programs for training, then it will really improve the performance. But if we use other like spurious programs uh, for training, then uh, it can it will just uh, like uh, give us some random predictions during the test time. The second issue is that the program search space could be uh, pretty large to like uh, provide training supervision, and this is especially the case when the program includes some nested operators. For example, when we are given a counting question. And um, even if we know that this problem should be solved by a counting operator, but with the ground truth answer, we only know the number of uh, passive spans operators that need to be called by the count operator. But we know nothing about uh, what exactly the passive spans we should uh, select. So uh, we need to enumerate among all possible passive spans. Similarly, when we are given a sorting question from the ground truth answer, we only have some partial knowledge of a specific key value pair, but we know nothing about other key value pairs to compare with. In these cases, our program search space grows exponentially to the input uh, like text length, which could be injectable when the passage becomes pretty long. Then uh, to uh, train our model uh, in, with the least like uh, search challenges, we designed the training algorithm called hard expectation maximization with stretch holding. I won't go into the technical details here, but the high level idea is that we will uh, first like, train our model on those simply uh, like simpler problems with fewer spurious programs. In such cases, it means that we are more confident about the quality of these uh, programs for training. Then uh, in the in the process, when we iteratively train the model, we will also use the current uh, program synthesizer to like uh, decode uh, more programs and uh, use it to like distinguish uh, like among like, uh, the remaining like, training programs to see uh, which ones are more likely to be co coherent with the uh, questions. So this can be achieved by uh, investigating the prediction confidence by the model. And uh, during the meantime, we will kind of uh, iteratively decaying the threshold of these confidence values. So we will, uh, we are, our model will be able to train on those like uh, samples where the model is initially less confident about. So in this like uh, iterative uh, uh, threshold decaying process, actually uh, it uh, naturally builds a training curriculum, uh, like kind of um, categorize questions into different difficulty levels without uh, any manual design. And uh, another effect is that it can help us filter out those potential annotation noises in a training set by kind of discarding those samples where the model predicts a, a very low confidence score. Now I will talk about our evaluation. So we first uh, evaluate our model on a job benchmark and we compare with uh, other like neural network baselines that achieve good performance on this like benchmark. 
So for all of our models, they, well, they designed some separate classification modules for different question types. So this is very different from our design, where we have a, like a single program module to handle all kinds of questions. So firstly, we show that uh, from the quantitative performance, our model can achieve like a better like accuracy than uh, all of these baselines at the time of submission. But I think the more interesting observations is that the predictions from our model better interpret the reasoning process to like uh, obtain these answers. So it supports the compositionality of different operators by design. As you can see from these examples, our model is able to predict programs for arithmetic calculation and multi-span extraction questions. And here I'm showing some more examples of the counting and uh, sorting programs where they can select uh, arguments for uh, many like different kinds of input questions. And all these programs can be just uh, like uh, searched uh, during the training time. So there's uh, indeed a uh, no annotation here. Wait, I have a quick oh, question. Uh, sure. about can you, like on the previous slide for these passage span, I mean that, a, like is there a neural network that's predicting the value from the passage span or how does that work exactly? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, uh, for our decoder design, we just uh, formulate the, this program as a token sequence. So for these operators, such as a count, passage span, etc., they were just uh, predicted from a fixed vocabulary because our domain-specific language is pre-designed. Then uh, for all these indexes, we, uh, we use a pointer network to select from the input. So we have some like, kind of attention. So for those like, um, like uh, indexes with a high attention score, we will just uh, use it as the argument to the hash span operators. But if, if okay, so now I now that I'm looking at it more carefully, so the the passage span doesn't seem like it matters, right? You just you're just counting how many things are in this list. Is that right? Uh, sure. From the evaluation, like uh, preference, sure. But we also hope that uh, these patch spans are interpretable, right? So it uh, makes okay, more yeah. sense. That that makes sense. Yeah, I was just confused what was going. Okay, thanks. So I'm just trying to show that uh, actually, um, um, although like uh, we do not have any like explicit uh, annotation, but uh, still these operate these like uh, arguments happen to be interpretable, and we think uh, these are like, very interesting observations to share. And in addition, if we uh, also add some more like a complicated mathematical operators into our language, then we can also support uh, like those uh, cases where uh, the math like um, programs are more complicated to solve these like, um, more, like uh, questions that require some more in-depth uh, domain knowledge in math. So for example, on math QA, uh, to solve such questions, we also need to know have some knowledge of the geometry, uh, physics, profit gain and uh, probability. And again, we show that if we uh, simply like add these like uh, new mathematical operators into our language, then we will uh, be able to like uh, get a good performance on uh, such kind of uh, tasks that uh, require like um, more in-depth mathematical calculation. So uh, this is about the second part. Uh, any other questions? I have a question about MassQA. So in MassQA, they actually have training programs. Uh, so like yes. you still need to like, use the like, hard EM algorithm since we have that. Yeah, so this is a great question. So for this uh, data set, we find that because uh, some of them, the mathematical uh, um, uh, programs are indeed uh, too complicated to search from scratch. So we uh, still use like, uh, let's say 20% of the programs as our starting point. Then for the remaining programs, we try to do like our like um, hard EM algorithm. So indeed, uh, you can see that if we do the like a uh, full supervised learning, uh, the performance is like still uh, much better than uh, like uh, searching some programs from scratch. So indeed, there is uh, there are some gaps there. Okay. So any other questions before we move on? Uh, okay, so uh, in the last part, I will talk about my work on neural symbolic machines for compositional generalization. To recap, uh, for compositional generalization, we uh, want the models to really like uh, generalize the learned knowledge of some basic components and a few of their uh, dem like demonstrations of their combinations. 
And at the test time, we can see that uh, some new combinations of these primitives. And in some cases, the test instructions can also be uh, longer than the training instructions. And for such kind of uh, generalization, uh, standard uh, sequence to sequence models or even recent transformer architectures uh, are not very capable um, of like uh, handling such kind of uh, like, um, generalization um, requirements. So uh, to really achieve a better level of uh, generalization, we designed our uh, neural symbolic stack machines approach, what we call NES. So at a high level, uh, still, um, like instead of asking the model to generate the final uh, answers or the final sequences, we designed the neural network as the controller to predict the execution traces, uh, which can be executed by our symbolic machine. So that after we execute this trace, it will produce the, the output sequence. So our symbolic uh, machine uh, has a key like a component, which is the stack uh, data uh, structure, which uh, supports recursion by design, uh, which uh, is uh, why this um, kind of design can lead us towards a better generalization performance. And also for supporting general purpose sequence to sequence learning, we add some sequence variation operators. And I will go into more details here to illustrate our um, symbolic machine design. So basically uh, for our stack design, we will kind of uh, like separate the input like, sequences into like uh, several like fragments by like uh, including different layers in the stack. And I will um, kind of describe why this is um, uh, important in, uh, to like uh, achieve a generalization. And besides the stack, we also maintain a queue to uh, like kind of process the input sequence. And we have a memory module to keep the intermediate execution outputs. And there are several operators that can be executed by the machine. Besides push and pop as standard stack operators, our machine also supports the shift reduce operators. So shift is for reading the input sequence and reduce is for like um, kind of uh, transforming the input of some input phrases to output phrases. So these shift reduce operators are kind of uh, inspired from existing shift reduce uh, parsers for some like uh, parsing tasks. Besides that, we also like, uh, introduced the concatenation operators to support the sequence manipulation tasks. And the final operator is just for terminating the machine. Here I present a simple like a uh, trace to illustrate how we can translate a natural language or action sequence called jump around right. So uh, this uh, example is taken from a benchmark called SCAM. So basically uh, from this like a uh, neural sim symbolic uh, design, one benefit is that it explicitly encouraged the model to learn some uh, sequence transformation rules and focus more on local context when it makes the predictions. So this is achieved by like uh, our like, uh, stack uh, architectural design where like uh, we kind of uh, enforce the model to like uh, look at uh, as uh, little context as possible uh, when like uh, the once a certain prediction like um like a decision is not a that does not should not require or like more information in the input so this could be important for for generalization to some like new combinations of these uh, primitives so um with this like um like symbolic uh, machine which kind of uh, regularizes our solution space, we can we hope that uh, once our model fits the training data, then uh, such kind of learned uh, sequence transformation rules can indeed uh, generalize better to a uh, new test inputs with like new combinations of these uh, primitive tokens. Then uh, similar to uh, like uh, our previous uh, like uh, works on neural symbolic readers, one central challenge here is still to train our model with weak supervision without any annotations of the ground truth execution traces. So we also need to like search for those traces that have the potential to generate better to new inputs. Then to really distinguish those like uh, traces that can generate better to other experienced like, execution traces. We propose the notion of operational equivalence. Uh, the high level uh, principle is that uh, semantically similar sequences to require execution traces with similar operators. For example, one special case is called primitive generalization, where two sequences only differ in primitive tokens. For example, if we compare the two input sequences, 
walk left and run and uh, jump left and run. We can see that both of them have the same uh, high level sentence structures. And the only difference is that we replace the input word walk into jump. So um, basically uh, for such two uh, sequences, their execution traces should have uh, the same like uh, operator sequence. And the only difference should happens when we want to translate the words work and jump. So which, uh, which should re reveal on the differences of the reduced arguments. And uh, if we can support some like uh, more complicated like, uh, operators like uh, concatenation, it also uh, helps us to capture um, more generalization rules and to better categorize input tokens. For evaluation, uh, we, uh, we measure our models on several compositional generalization benchmarks. And as we described uh, at the beginning of my talk, for such a uh, like, uh, measurement, we usually uh, kind of um, assume that our, all the data are generated from a uh, like rigorous uh, grammar or, like, or, or transformation rules. So in this case, if the model really captures the underlying rules, the transition accuracy is able to achieve 100%. So this is very different from the challenge of handling uh, real-world uh, noisy data, uh, where they did not emphasize the distribution shift. So first, uh, I will show the results on the scan. So this is a benchmark about translating natural language sequences into action commands. And uh, from the previous uh, examples we used to illustrate the machine, uh, they are kind of taken from this benchmark. So from the comparisons to other like uh, works uh, also like try to improve compositional dryization, we show that uh, our model can achieve 100% dryization on all splits and uh, without the training data augmentation. So for some of the baselines, they require some meta learning or data augmentation to like enforce the model to learn this kind of uh, primitive uh, dryization. And uh, we also evaluate our work on some other related uh, tasks about compositional generalization. So future learning of compositional instructions is the, is the experiment about like evaluating humans' uh, compositional reasoning that we, dis we illustrated before. So compositional machine translation is a simplified like, a, like synthetic English to French translation that emphasizes uh, more on some phrase generalization. So uh, this benchmark was also like proposed in the same work um, where uh, the scan benchmark was proposed. And context-free grammar parsing is uh, a benchmark we proposed in uh, our early, earlier works. So basically the idea is that we, will ch we have a training curriculum with around like, um, like uh, 100 uh, like training samples. So the average input length is 10. And all of these samples are drawn from a uh, context-free grammar with around 40 to 50 production rules. But at the test time, we want the model to like generalize to a much longer inputs. Let's say the input could have an average length of 5,000. So uh, it, the model is required to generalize to inputs that are 500 times longer than the training samples. So uh, since uh, both training and test samples are drawn from like uh, the same context-free grammar, if we really learn the grammar, then we should be able to achieve 100% generalization. But we can see that uh, if we do not have like this like symbolic machine design, then such realization could be very challenging to achieve. But for all these like uh, benchmarks that require uh, different like um, kinds of compositional realization, we show that our next model is able to achieve one hundred percent realization on all of them. Then uh, to summarize my talk, uh, in this talk I discuss my program synthesis works from like a uh, like two different aspects. One is more for program sense applications. Another is about how we can like, um, like have the neural symbolic framework for understanding the languages. So in the first part of my work about a uh, special coder, we show that modeling the structure and multi-modality of the programming um, context facilitates the model to infer the human intent from ambiguous program specifications for real world applications. Then uh, from my work on neural symbolic design for language understanding, we show that combining differentiable deep neural networks and symbolic program representations is promising to, for complex reasoning over natural language descriptions. And also such programmatic representations could better interpret the compositional reasoning process. Finally, the design of the symbolic machine is crucial to regularize the search space of solutions 
And in particular, supporting recursion and composition of primitive functions is the key to systematic generalization. Finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators uh, of these projects. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, further pushing forward the, like, the complexity of the programs that can be synthesized by the models. And eventually, we really hope that we can learn some like, um, like, uh, models to like, uh, generalize robustly in the wild. And uh, we can kind of really enable a good symbolic reasoning uh, using our deep neural networks. Yeah, uh, thank you again for joining my talk. And I would like to like, have uh, more discussion. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the great talk. Um, I guess we have a few minutes for questions, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, it's, it's a great talk. And for the neurosymbolic machine, I'm wondering if you have a sense of how well it would perform on non-synthetic data. Yeah, uh, this is a great question. And also this is uh, one like challenge I've been thinking about how to like uh, really like um, balance the neural and symbolic parts so you can understand like also more noisy data. Because for the symbolic machine, uh, we kind of um, implicitly assume that uh, like those like of prediction patterns can kind of be just extracted from like attending on the local context. But in the real uh, world, there could also be many like uh, kind of uh, like a uh, long range dependency issues. Like for example, the context of the passages could really like uh, change how humans like um, understand like the, the uh, understand some like subsequent of these like uh, like uh, sequences. So um, for for me, uh, one thing I've been like uh, like exploring uh, recently is that we, I really want to like add some like uh, simplified symbolic modules into some like a uh, more like um. A powerful uh, language model representations. Like, let's say if we can really have some like uh, post processing steps uh, from the GPT three uh, outputs, then uh, whether we can at least uh, add some like uh, simplified like, uh, operators to support some like uh, numerical like uh, calculation, or also like uh, to uh, learn how to like uh, segment the input uh, sequences in some like um, in some simple ways, so that it does not uh, add too much uh, computational overhead while still like kind of can improve the generalization and reasoning a bit. So this is definitely very challenging. So to think about how to like um, really like um, balance the neural and symbolic components well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had, a, I was a little, I might've missed it, but in the last part, the neural symbolic stack machine, how do you, what is the strategy for training the, so you don't have mm -hmm. supervised traces, right? So how do you generate the training data to train the model? Mm -hmm. oh. So yeah, I so basically the, the training part is uh is also like um related to the previous like training algorithm for neural symbolic reader. So basically in the in the each phase we need to like uh search search for execution traces that lead to the correct uh, output sequences. Then uh we will kind of uh train on, on like uh shorter sequences first and iteratively like use our current model to de decode more traces and then uh, train on like uh, long longer sequences. So this is still iterative. Like a I, yeah, I guess I was confused. So these sequences, are they also some, like where do these sequences come from? Is it from some kind of search over possible sequences or is it like, where do the training sequences come from? Mm -hmm. So in the original data set, we have like uh, the, the source and target uh, sequences for sequence to sequence learning formats. Then uh, we will search for these uh, execution traces. So we can imagine that, uh, let's say if the, uh, for those like sequences that only include like one word, then it will be very easy to search for the trace. It will be just a sh shift to read and reduce, right? So we can, the model can start from here. Then later on, when we, when we search, like uh, do the list like, um, like a uh, model decoding, it can like uh, iteratively like search for longer sequences. So actually there is another underlying like, assumption of the data. So basically our data needs to be arranged in a, like, um, you know, like a good curriculum so that uh, it does not only contain those like super long sequences because then the model can search uh, for nothing at the beginning. Yeah, I see. Okay, so when I said sequences, I, I, I meant the execution traces. So where do the execution traces come from that you use during training? Mm -hmm. So uh, these uh, traces are kind of, uh, they can be like both decoded, uh, they can kind of, they are kind of uh, just uh, decoded by the models. But uh, at the beginning, because the initial 
like uh, input sequences could be very short. So or even a random pro, uh, a random model can search for it. So for example, when the input only has like a uh, one one or two tokens, then we can all just do some like shift reduce final. Then it could be very easy for the model to to search. And, and in a search process, we can also have some heuristics. Right? So for example, for sequence to sequence learning, a very simple but effective heuristic is that if uh, some of the generated sub sequences are already like uh, not part of the ground truth output, then this trace is definitely not useful. So we can just uh, proceed to other, other branches. So there are some ways to speed up this uh, search process. But the, the underlying assumption is that we indeed need uh, like, uh, some amount of uh, simple sequences for the search to get started. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. For mm -hmm. clarifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think probably other? like one interesting non-synthetic task that this model can try is the constitu constituency parsing of natural language, because so th so the actions in this model is a superset of shift reduce, and the shift reduce parser can already do quite well on that task. So, mm -hmm. um, like in principle, it's possible to train this model and to perform parsing very well, and because that's a non-synthetic data set, which could be a very strong evidence. And also mm -hmm. for that data set, you have the ground truth execution traces, so you don't have to generate them. Yeah. So actually, uh, when the ground truth execution traces are available, then uh, training indeed becomes like easier, and also the performance is uh, easier to control. So yeah, definitely. So this is so basically for our neural symbolic stack machines work. So the initial version is uh, like uh, just for handling the context free grammar parsing. So indeed, if we already know like the parsing rules, it could be like a uh, much much easier. But a lot, the main tricky thing is always to like how to like really learn these like um, execution traces, the ship reduce operators without any like uh, explicit supervision on it. Okay, um, any other questions? I think we have time for maybe one more. There's... Okay, yeah, I guess that, um, yeah, thanks again for giving the talk today. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining and I'll see you all next time. Yeah, uh, thank you again for inviting and it is great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thanks for coming, bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.